Hello, hello. Hello? Yeah. Hey, you there? Yeah, I can hear you now. Can yeah. you see me? I can see you and hear you. Can you see me? All right, all right. So my my apologies. Uh, it must have been my my audio setup. I tried to do it fancy, and that's what you get. Anyway, listen. Uh, um, I think I started recording, but let me pause record. All right, folks, we have him here. This has been a long time desire of mine to have uh, my guest on. Before I I get into talking to him, I want to give a little bit of background you know, um, just on myself, because I think it feeds into what we're going to talk about. I think uh, we kind of started in the same period in 1979. I was a commodity futures broker for Merrill Lynch, basically a salesman on the phone, calling people up, trying to get $10,000 to invest in whatever pork bellies. And I said, you know, this is never going to work because, you know, they're going to be blowing out their money in a week. And shortly after that um, was the uh, uh, initiation or the beginning of stock index futures. I, th I think it started on the Kansas on the, uh, Kansas City on the uh, the value uh, line index, and then eventually I moved over. I became a member of the New York Futures Exchange, where we traded uh, index contracts on the New York Stock Exchange. And Chicago, of course, at pretty much at the same time, launched its launched its S and P futures contracts. And over the course of my career, I've been a member of four different exchanges. You know, the uh, starting off with the Knife, and then I went to the NYMEX, I went to the COMEX, and ultimately, in early 1990, I went out to the CME. But I have to say this: on, on every exchange I was, it was a fascinating experience because. You know, each of those things were, and I tell this to people all the time, were like a, a, a microcosm of the world. Like you had, you know, you're strong, you had your weak, you had your leaders, you had your followers. And it was a, it was almost a fascinating sociological. I always thought like you could do a sociological thesis on this for a PhD. And I saw it coming from New York, you know, there were a lot of tough guys in, in our pit. I mean, you know, guys just from the streets, NYMEX and the COMEX guys. And uh, maybe I had a certain attitude about myself just being a New Yorker. But when I went out to Chicago, I was floored by the CME when I became a member there. Uh, you know, prior to the World Trade Center getting knocked down in 2001, 9-11, you know, our um, exchange was housed in, in four World Trade Center. Um, and, you know, we thought like that was the greatest thing. And of course, we had the New York Stock Exchange, which, is the, which was the leading equity exchange at the time. But when I went out to Chicago, when I saw the CME, I was like, wow, like these guys are so far ahead. And I went and I became a member and, um, I started trading S&P futures and that's when I saw you and you, you know, you stuck out in a way where in the past, those people who I kind of, you know, admired or were impressed by on other exchanges where I were with their dynamism, with, the, with their strength, with their energy, uh, with their grit. I mean, I never saw anything like you. And I used to see how like you dominated, you dominated a pit and an industry where, and we're going to get into that, um, at a level that I had never seen before. So without wanting to bore you and let, let me before we even get into this let me ask you about your new career because i think you switched over now you're a, a a director of a firm called direct edge which i think is in cybersecurity. uh what made you do when did you do that and what made you do that yeah hi mike thanks for having me on well that was it's been a kind of a long journey i you know i left the floor in 2003 um and I think it had run its course. 
Um, I actually, when I left the uh, floor in 2003, it was the first year I didn't make any money. I broke even. I said, you know what? This is over with. Time to go on to a new thing. Um, and so I actually started investing in buying nursing homes. Really? And, uh, yeah. So I was uh, transitioning. You know, I always had a, you know, a, the funny thing, I always tell people that the, the the CME was the best thing and the worst thing ever happened to me. It was the best thing is that I made more money than I can ever imagine. The worst thing is it made you lazy, right? And, you know, I, I always considered myself a pretty smart guy and that I could see trends in a lot of things. But all the things that I took from being a trader uh, is nothing different than running a business, right? And mm -hmm. how do you manage risk? At the end of the day, it's all about managing risk um, and, you know, deliver a service or goods or whatever it is. So I uh, saw the demographics with the uh, uh, baby boomers retiring, and I thought that that would be a good investment. And I, I was right. I started buying the nursing home beds between twenty dollars and $40,000 a bed. And uh, I got up to about 1,800 beds, wow. including with my own capital. Um, wow. I had about $30, $30 million invested in, in buying the homes. Uh, my goal was to get to 3,000 beds and then turn it over and sell it to a REIT. Um, I started taking my debt, which I personally guaranteed, and I was uh, transitioning to um, non-recourse debt, which was HUD, HUD financing and things like that. Meanwhile, I got caught in the winds of 2008, 9, 10. And right. It hit me around 2012, I had a bank failure and uh, that uh, literally came in and they literally destroyed my life. Uh, the bank uh, the bank failed. The state of Illinois owed me $10 million. They couldn't pay their bills. And um, I got foreclosed out. I mean, literally it cost me $30 million in cash. So at the... Uh, 57 or 58 years old, I had to come up with a new world. And wow. And um, fortunately, I got involved with this young kid that I knew um, when he was 18 years old. He married one of my best friend's daughters, uh, was an IT guy, did some IT stuff for me on the floor, uh, ended up going to uh, the Department of Justice, then Bank of America, where he headed up a cybersecurity team of about 250 analysts. Uh, and he came to me and said, look, I want to start my own cybersecurity company. I said, well, I go, I got a few, few dollars left and um, I'm smart and healthy. <laughs> and I could work. So we started our company called Defend Edge and it's a holistic cybersecurity company. Um, we actually defend and monitor companies and stop them from being hacked. We've negotiated ransoms with the hackers, which is fun. I've always done that. And they, you know, the guys look at me, what do you know about this? I go, listen, buddy, this is nothing but price discovery. They don't want to put you out of business. They want money. So I would be negotiating the stuff. And, you know, basically I would tell people I in the email, tell them that we're not paying that. We, we're going to care. We're done. We're not paying it. And the owner of the company would look at me and he'd be in panic. I go, don't worry about it. He'll be back. He wants money. That's all he wants. It's amazing he because the, the, what yeah. you say about price discovery it is like something you learned as a trader, something you understood intrinsically as a trader. Um, right. and, and I didn't know about that, uh, you know, the, the bankruptcy or the failure you had in 2007, 2009, of course, that was the, that was a great financial crash. Uh, but your ability to bounce back, your ability to bounce back. I, I think that's, um, by the way, I have to mention also that, uh, there's a wonderful, um, documentary of you on a, a website on a youtube channel called tastylive.com i'm yeah, sure tasty you're uh, yeah tasty trade i'm yeah. sure you're aware of it and, and you know yeah. when i you know knew you and we were never close or anything like that but i i did of course everyone watched you i mean you came off as this really tough guy but in the what struck me in that video was your sensitivity and I remember you talking about the house that you had a you sold or you had to give away, and how that represented such good times for your family. And, and I think you choked up in that video. And I was like, "Wow, you know, that's a side of this guy. Like, like you were the toughest guy in there." And I want to talk about. We're going to get into talk about futures trading because I know that my fo my my followers here on YouTube they want to know so much about you. Maybe you're sick of talking about it, and I apologize in advance if you are, but 
you know, I, I, you're doing a very needed and, 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 um, you know, positive service by talking about it because there are people out there who, you know, they're trying to make money. They're trying to trade, not obviously on the level, uh, uh, that you were, but yeah, I was very touched by, you know, your sensitivity and, and how emotional you got. Like, I just, I never saw that in you, uh, in the pit. I mean, you were dominant. And like I said, you know, in the, in the four exchanges that I was a member of, and also I managed money for a while for Paul Tudor Jones, and I was running a prop desk for Credit Suisse. I was living in Switzerland for 10 years. I was running a prop desk. Um, you know, I, I never saw somebody so dominant uh, and, and, you know, forceful in the pit like that. Can you give us just a little bit? And I know this is like a is like a terrible question to ask you because you've probably been asked this a million times. Like how you got started in futures trading? I think you knew an older man who was a gold trader at the time uh, on the CME, and and he got you involved, correct? Yeah. So um, you know, it's a it, it's a, a matter of mishaps and 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 fortuitous things that happened to me. Uh, you know, as you know, in the documentary, my dad got murdered um, two days after I graduated college. I was, uh, you know, it was always my dream to go to law school. My mom was the legal secretary to a guy whose name was Maury Kravitz. And Maury Kravitz and Leo Malamed were actually, so Leo Malamed and they were law partners. Yeah. And then there was a young guy named Jack Sanders, who my mom gave his first job to. So um, I was actually playing handball with another guy. Uh, named Lou Matta, and he said, you know, why don't you come down to the exchange? I actually, in 1981, started talking to him about gold futures and said I wanted to open a trading account. And he said, you don't want to do that. He said, Louis, come down to the floor and see, uh, you know, what's going on in the floor. If you open an account and just try to trade, you're going to lose your money. So what happened was I, I was playing, I, I went there one day and I walked through the floor and I saw the rush and the emotion and the, the chaos, the sure energy coming from the floor. Um, I said, I got to be here. This is what I got to do. Was so, that the thing for you? Was that it, it was like the energy and the emotion and the, ru and the rush as opposed to, hey, I think I can make money out of this. It was more like a, you know, just like an emotional stimulation that brought you down there. It was more the emotional thing. And, you know, I was going to go to law school and, um, you know, I had a felony conviction. When I was 19 years old from uh, an aggravated battery, a fight I got. And I had a meeting with the dean of law school in Chicago. And he said, Lewis, even if you get through law school, you could be de denied the bar. So, you know, I would, you know, my dad died. I was driving a truck. I was, you know, supporting my mother and my brother. And I said, you know what? Um, I got to I got to make a, a different career path. Um, so. I took a job as a runner making $127 a week. And uh, literally I was, it was fortunate too, because I paid my, my, my sold my mother's house, had some money and I put um, $250,000 in a CD earning 18% for three years. And wow. uh, so you remember back in 1981. So literally that money that my mother was earning was able to pay her bills and, you know, keep her sustained. And uh, I went down to the floor and, I walked over to the gold pit and the biggest trader in the gold pit, lo and behold, is, was my mom's old boss, Maury Kravitz. Wow. I, and I tapped him on the shoulder and he looks at me and goes, hey, kid, what are you doing here? I go, well, <laughs> you know, I got a job. I said, you know, being a, a runner. And he said, uh, well, come back in two weeks, going to be my clerk. And that started my career. I, you know, a long time friend, family friend. And he was the biggest gold trader, filling orders and trading. And he was partners with Jack Sanders in a clearing firm. And his best friend was Leo Muhammad. So I had high friends at the top that opened up the doors for me. And then wow. uh, it was up to me to, to make it on my own at that point. I have to tell you a, a funny story. Um, it wasn't funny for me, but I, I think now that I look back at it at the time, like, um, the uh, the the knife the New York Futures Exchange I think we launched about the same time as the CME launched the S and P 500 futures we were trading futures on the uh, 
New York Stock Exchange Index. And I remember also as a novice going down there, I had, I had never done anything. I was basically a, you know, a salesman for Merrill Lynch Commodities at the time. And there was a lot of order flow, like in the beginning, like I was just down there as a local, you know, independent trader making a market. Like I put a bid and offer and I get hit on the bid or I'd sell on the offer. Worst case, I'd scratch. And every day I'd come home. It was like a cash machine. I made money. And it wasn't it wasn't long after that. And then I bought a seat. You know, the seats then were like 20,000 bucks. It was not a lot. It was not long after that that the business really started to flow to Chicago. And I, I give a lot of credit to guys like Leo Malamud and those people in Chicago who I, I think that the story goes like he would drag people into the pits and say, you know, trade this, create volume. And what bothered me was we were literally connected. The knife was literally physically connected to the New York Stock Exchange, which was the preeminent equities exchange in the world yeah. but yet the 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 uh the specialists and the floor traders on the new york stock exchange it's like they didn't give a shit about us they didn't they, they didn't support us and it wasn't long after that uh before the volume moved to chicago and and my advantage if you want to call that as a local you know being able to like be a market maker it dried up and i just had a learn how to become like a trader, you know, in terms of which way the market's going to go. And that was a very tough thing for me. Um, I ended up switching after that. I went to the NYMEX because I had a friend who worked uh, for an oil company at the time. But so when, you, when, I, when you when you look at, so when you look at that, I, I actually started out trading gold and we were the, we had the largest gold contract at the time. And we eventually lost that to COMEX. The COMEX. Comex was actually letting uh, them close their spreads out of line. And so the volume was starting to dry up. Plus, you got to remember, gold went up to 700. It was like 750, 800. 800 and I then it, it started to do its, bull, its bear market. When we won that contract, that was the big, biggest coup. I mean, think about it. You're right. New York Stock Exchange are known for stocks. You had Wall Street. You had all right. the brokerage firms. And, you know, Chicago is always known for the futures exchange. Right. So when we got the the S and P five hundred, Patrick, you're exactly right. Leo, Jack, they they tapped guys like me on the shoulder and said we need to go into the pit and create volume. So literally, every member was going in there and trading ten lots with each other and scratching them to create volume. And then, you know, the S and P five hundred futures is still the world marks benchmark for returns. Yes. Right. Anything yes. you do, whatever fun you have, everything's benchmarked against the 500 so absolutely when we got that futures and then you know mutual funds and other uh head funds and things were using uh the s p 500 the hut you know to to actually hedge their cash position it just created and, and you know so from 1983 i think we started trading uh the futures um to 86 i was filling orders and trading and I had all the major counts. I had Sol Solomon Brothers. I had, I had I had Merrill Lynch. I had every, every major account was my account. And well, when you say it was your account, account, you were you actually order filling, or they were yes. just like yeah. you were, you were. I was filling the orders. So I was, I will I'll tell you. So between what I traded and what I filled, we were doing one hundred twenty thousand contracts a day. I was ten percent of the volume. So that wow. that that. And the order filling, just execute order, just gave me the sheer presence of being a big player. And then in 1987, when they outlawed dual trading, meaning you couldn't be an order filler. Right, that trader, was that. It was that. I was, making a million, I, was, I was making a million dollars a year just trading order filling, and I gave that up because I, I want to get to 1987, but not right now because you have a famous story about that, about uh, yeah. the crash. I, I I talk to people about that. I'm sure you've you've recounted that a zillion times, and I apologize in advance uh, to ask you about that. But but we'll get to that. I got to the CMA uh, CME in 1990. By that time, you were not filling orders. You were like a local at that time, correct? I gave up filling orders in '87. Okay, you gave up filling orders in '87. The one thing that struck me about you, Lewis. 
and I have to be honest about this, is that every other exchange I traded on, which was, you know, the, the knife, the Comex, the NYMEX, the CME, it always seemed to me, and I, I talk to people about this all the time, it always seemed to me that the locals, for some reason, it was like a psychological thing. We always wanted to sell the market. We always wanted to go short. We are, but you always seemed like the guy who was standing there, you know, bidding all the time. And I'm like, well, you know, what, is it, what does this guy see? Am I wrong? But it seemed like yeah. you were always there bidding. And, and look, I can tell you this right now. The S&P, when I was down there, was at 248. It's at 4,000 right now. Like, why were you always bidding? Well, we're in a 150-year bull market. Why would you be selling? Here's what happens to professional that, traders. There is they get genius, there, but... right? They get there and they think that the market goes down faster than it goes up. It's not true, right? And so, you know, um, when I was an order filler, I started noticing one thing because I had a deck. And, you know, for your listeners know what a deck is, all the orders would come into the, into, uh, into the pit and all my clients it was we actually would put them into a, a thing called a deck where you had all the buys and the sells right and right. all the buy stops and sell stops right. we would organize the deck right. and so i really got interested in i would have five different clients that have sells at the same price or they'd have buys at the same price and i'm going well these guys aren't talking to each other so what the hell is going on and why are they why are they putting the orders in here or they'd have buy stops at the same price sell stops or you know uh they, they'd be technical levels so I really got involved at that point into technical analysis and basically doing charts. I was going to ask you about that because actually that was one of the questions on my uh, on my notes here because I wanted to know what your process was. You didn't see like wh what were you doing in the morning before the market opened? I mean, were you literally looking over charts or chart levels? I didn't and like. I, I didn't. I by the, didn't. By the see time, you. by the time that you, you had met me, Mike, or saw me, I had three guys who worked for me doing charts, and they all had different things. One was a GAN guy, one was a market timing guy, one was a you know a, they had different different ideas of how to evaluate the market. So they would simultaneously submit their buys and sells to me and the technical analysis. I would review all of it. I'd keep it on my charts. In my pocket, put it in my pocket. Then I would have a headphone oh. upstairs, and I would be talking to those guys. So when you said, you know, I was always buying, I was a two-way trader, but I only traded what the market was telling me. And what I would use, what I would do when I was standing in, in the in the pit, is that the order floor tells you what's going on, right? And so I would, I would, I was different than most locals. I wasn't there to get in front of a trade that was being made by an order filler and then hope I could, you know, you know, get a few ticks here and there 10 times a day. I wanted to make position trading daily. And that's why it always that's why I was uh seemed to be a contrary contrary to everybody else because I I didn't care about what was what the locals were doing. I cared about what the technicals were telling me. So um if I have this correctly, if I understand this correctly, you didn't get like um, the edge, let's say, from the top step brokers who were coming in, let's say, from, you know, uh, Solomon Brothers at the time or Goldman Sachs. And you're like, hey, here I am for 100 and they'd hit you and you knew you could lay it off immediately, you know, for another tick or two. That's not what you were doing. You were you were literally position yeah. trading. I was position trading. And when those guys came in when Goldman and you know the the institutional traders came in yeah I knew I was right when I knew I was right because they were reinforcing it it looked like in the minute it looked like you know and you know, right when I was putting positions on they didn't look right but all of a sudden when they the institutions came in right then I knew I was right and then I would just force the market well I, I have I, a, I have a theory about that and I think I'm right you might tell me I'm wrong. I think those guys employed spotters. Like, this is funny. I come from Wall Street. I'm a New Yorker. You know, I've been on Wall Street my whole life. You know, 
I think those guys employed spotters in the pit or alongside the pit. Like, what's Lewis doing? What's Lewis? They were literally calling the desks in New York to tell them what you were doing. And we're talking about the biggest institutions in the world. We're talking about, you know, Goldman and, and Merrill Lynch and, and Morgan Stanley and Solomon Brothers. There were people there whose job it was to relay back to New York what you were doing. Yeah, so there were, there were, they used to do these squawk boxes. They couldn't yeah. really say what was going on. So they used to call me Big Italy. So oh, yeah. That, that was my nickname on a squawk oh, really? box. And then my brother was called Little Italy. Your brother's and then, Joey, right? Joey is Yeah, my me. brother Joey. And then, um, well, Paul Tudor Jones had a guy. I met Paul a couple times. He had a guy that just watched me. And they used yeah. to tell me, they used to tell him, watch Lewis. He know he's he's watching the order flow. He knows what's going on. So, you know, yeah, you know, they they used to watch. They used to know what I was doing. So I had to outsmart them, right? So sometimes when I wanted to sell, I would bid the mark up, bid the market up, and give my orders to the brokers to fill them for me. If I wanted to buy, I would do it the other way around. Yeah. So, you know, it's look, it was it's, it's like it, it was, was like a poker game a little bit. Yeah, like always a poker game. Always a poker, poker game. game. Yeah. It was a poker game. But Let me, I think the really thing that really solidified myself was the idea that I filled orders for five, six years. Uh -huh. And I had all the big firms, you know, and it was funny because there were some people when they came in, they were always wrong. They would buy the market. Uh, and they were always wrong. That, and then they would sell the market. They were always wrong. In the immediate, like one of the things I was really good at, say the unappointment was coming on Friday. Yeah, I was able to watch order flow all week long, and I could tell you what the number was going to be, because yeah. those institutions. Come on, Mike. This is all you know. Look, I, you know, we the commodity guys in Chicago got a bad rap. They had the FBI investigation and all that bullshit. But no, but a lot of that stuff, uh, there were no convictions. I mean, that was all bullshit. Yeah, but at the end of the day, we were Boy Scouts compared to what went on in Wall Street. All right, so Wall uh, yeah, Street for sure. You know, and and. In fact, uh, and after 1987, I got called by these two guys, Bruin and Bruin. I guess they did. They were 2% of the NASDAQ volume. And they wanted me to uh, do a deal with them. They flew me out to New York and said, can you tell us where all the orders are? And I go, can't do that. That's, you know, trading in front of the customer markets uh, or customer markets or order, order flow. I can't disclose orders to you. And I was filling <laughs> orders at that time. So, you know... Um, I, I, you know, look, trading's an inside game. Um, it's hard to be, it's hard to be a, a, a trader if you don't have deep pockets and just out there and trying to, uh, you know, make, make some money, especially now, um, liquidity is, is probably made by eight or nine firms. Yeah. And that's it. Let's, let's transition to now because, uh, we're obviously in a different time. The floor is gone. Uh, we're into electronic trading. I'll tell you a funny story. Like when I went to the CME to become a member, you know, they make you go through that one week training course and stuff like that. And at the end of the training course, I remember they took us all into a room and there were a bunch of like these, you know, old fashioned computer terminals. And they said, this is the future. It's called the Globex. And we all like laugh. We're like, yeah, like that's ever going to happen, you know? And like, <laughs> it did happen. Look, it, you know, like it, it blew everything away. But let, let me ask you something about like, because what you said, you know, there's five or six that this algo trading stuff. I mean, it, it kind of reminds me of the days, like I, when you talk about the Comex, I remember the notorious days of the Comex and I knew some of those guys who made, you know, millions upon millions just crossing customer orders and front running customer orders and stuff like that. And it, it wasn't illegal at the time. It, maybe it was. I, it wasn't illegal uh, as far as the exchange was concerned. And those guys, a lot of them, you know, they had seats on the exchange board and stuff like that. If you look at a situation now with these algos, especially if I look at somebody like uh, Citadel, Ken Griffin, right? I don't know if you know him, but like, he just yeah. buys the order flow from like Schwab and all these other things like all they're doing. And I know, by the way, I know Vinny, Vinny Viola, who runs Virtue Financial and 
he's done very, very well. And, you know, no knock against him. You know, the guys, uh, yeah, but uh, they went Point, five years without a losing trade. West Point graduate and stuff yeah. like that. Um, he was very, he was very good friends with Jack Sander. I remember one day walking, I was crossing Park Avenue near the uh, Waldorf Astoria and, uh, we're just crossing the street, and then, like, he was coming, and I'm kind of like, I, I know you, right? And, like, he's like, yeah, I know you. And he was wearing, like, this tattered old cardigan, and he was with his wife. And I'm like, where are you going? And he's like, I, I got a job up at the Waldorf. And I'm like, oh, you mean you're, you're doing construction? He said, no, I bought the tower on top, right? <laughs> so, like, but, like, then he got he got very early interested into this algo trading, and, uh, He's got that firm virtue financial, but um, yeah, you know they. He also is one of the investors of the uh, uh, Memex, the Members Exchange. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I know he bought the Florida Panthers, uh, yeah. so he owns that too. But um, it was funny because he he never stood out to me when I was a NYMEX member, and I was down there at the same time. Like he was a quiet guy. He became chairman of the NYMEX. And I think he was he was very much involved in, you know, eventually uh, that selling off, you know, to the CME and stuff like that. But uh, he was a very quiet guy. He didn't stand out to me as like you. You stood out. I mean, you know, anyone who knew you knew that you stood out. You You were a force of nature down there. I mean, you, you know. But uh, he didn't, and and I was surprised when I found out about the level of of his uh, success. I mean, it was it was incredible. But he seems like a decent guy. But um, let me ask you something, just personally, and, and this is I think what a lot of my viewers, you know, because they struggle with this. They struggle with the what I call the mental game. Okay, and I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. A lot of this whole trading business. It's mental. I always say if the if the market was a person, its job would be to like to, to fuck you up. I'm sorry, to make you do the wrong thing. Right. Um, how did you deal with, first of all, did you average losing trades to try to break even on them? Uh, and how did you manage mentally, emotionally losers? Yeah, you know, no, the answer is no, I didn't average trades. I had, um, you know, because I was more of a position scalper, um, I had a buy area, I had a stop area, and I never violated that, that really? those rules. I had a sell area, I had a stop area. So I looked for market momentum, I developed some trading programs, and, um, you know, you, you just, you know, you, you you can't you can't go through being a trading career. I mean, there are, I think I wrote a thing called the Ten Commandments years ago, and I don't know where they are. But guess what? Everybody. I, I saw I saw world, that, and I, actually, I was going to ask you about that. You 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 wrote like the ten trading mistakes everyone should avoid. Right, and and everybody has copied those. Every one of those rules I've seen rewritten in some form. And all it was was all the mistakes I made over the last, you know, you know, the, you know, before I wrote my book in 1996, it was all the mistakes I made and over and over and over and how I dealt with it. You know, I, I always tell people everybody loves their winners, but you learn more from, from your losing trades, right? You know, there's no wishing, praying when it comes to trading, right? The market tells you. And the and reason the market is so hard for, you know, I mean, you got AI out there. Why, why can't AI pick market tops and bottoms every day? You know why? Because everybody, the markets function on two things. They function on um, uh, greed, right, right, and fear, right. And everybody has a different level of greed, and everybody has a different level of fear. I always say that you know the market is a dynamical system. It might look predictable, uh, but in the end, because of the the millions of, of inputs that goes into it. You know, it, it's like, uh, what, what's his name? I forget his name. Who wrote the book, like, uh, uh, Fooled by, by Randomness. Uh, Taleb, Nassim Taleb, right? Fooled by Randomness, the, this idea that, you know, things look like patterns, 
But in fact, they're not really patterns. We get fooled by that. And you're so right. You're right that, you know, it, it's run on human emotion. And you brought up a very interesting point about artificial intelligence, because who is inputting the intelligence, right? It's the old thing like garbage in, garbage out. If you're putting me as an economist, I see like chat GPT right now. I could I could um, type in something about economics and the you know what I get back is like ridiculous because it was it was typed in or, or it was programmed in by an economic perspective that's just wrong. So like, yeah, that's what makes it very very I mean, hard. You know, look, every, everybody. I used to tell that to guys like I, I created some trading programs. Um, and so when you were, you know, when people got into doing a hedge fund, I started a hedge fund and had it in the BBI and I was raising money to trade it. And, you know, back then everybody wanted to know if I was a computer, a computer uh, driven technology, or was it a, you know, was an algorithm trading and, or were you just, um, you know, used to trade by, a human like i made all the decisions right and you know the, the the argument used to be you know everybody wanted to give money to people that were computer driven right and then and they would look at these computer programs and so i used to argue with them i go you know you know what happens with computer people that that uh, put trading algorithms together they go what i said as soon as the program doesn't perform like it said it was the model they go in there and they optimize well, if you're going to optimize because you had a few, uh, you know, losing trades in a row, then your program really wasn't that very good. wasn't very good, was it? Well, so, you know, that's that's a great story because I remember, and, and that's also the book that's the I think what it's called the smartest guys in a room or something like that by the guys who who ran uh, what was that hedge fund that blew up in, in the '90s? I forget the name of it. Uh, um, something long-term capital management yeah, long-term right? capital yeah, yeah but th i remember uh, i actually was on the i was on the committee at the really? that did the actually did the study into why that it blew up and because I they were trying to blame the futures they're trying to blame the futures right they, they, they don't want to blame really themselves because yeah. they're the smartest guys right it can't be us it's got to be the futures but i remember there was a head uh, like trading technologist at Morgan Stanley. This is going back in the 80s. And they developed this black box system that was like, this thing was making money like every single day, right? And then it blew up. And, and he was like, well, what do you want from us? Like, you know, things change and the environments change. You know, that, that yeah. you're supposed to be on top of that. But yet there's a myriad of things that go in. Anyway, we don't have a lot of time and I want you to talk about, again, just indulge me, please. The, the famous 1987 stock market crash. I was in New York at the time. You know, I have my own personal story about that. But your story is really cool about actually you were in Switzerland at the time, right? You were in, yeah. in Zurich. And I think you called your brother or something like that. Like, what's going on? The market's down like a thousand points or something crazy. Tell the story. No, was, uh, so I had left on that Friday afternoon and I I had a couple of things going on. One, I was short 20 S&Ps. And by the time I got to New York to change planes, I had made like 250,000 on a 20 lot. And uh, the market just crashed and kept going. And so I called my clerk on the floor, Joni Weber. I said, make sure you get me out. I said, I think the market's gonna bounce on Monday. And, you know, I was kind of aggravated that I was going to this trip. I was going to Switzerland and Italy just with five guys, friends of mine, just to screw off, you know, and because yeah. I had never been to uh, Europe. So um, that Monday afternoon or morning, I was in Piaget and I was trying to buy a watch for my wife, you know, try to, you know, make her feel better about me going to Italy with a bunch of guys. Uh and um, so um, I look outside and I see on the ticker tape. The Dow was down 350. Well, you got to remember. At that time, that's a huge. The Dow was, the Dow was only 3,500. Yeah. Like high. And it lost half the value in three days. Yeah. Right? People don't realize, like, we, that was a the, the the big day, that Black Monday, or that 22% decline. That that would be 
Uh, where's it down now at 33,000? I mean, that would be almost a 7,000 point drop, right? Well, we were down 50% for the week in three days. So yeah. you think about that. You went from 30,000 to 15,000 in three days, people would be shitting themselves. For right. Sure. right? <laughs> so they think the world is melting. And so <laughs> I go back to my room and my brother had called me and my wife called me, said, my brother goes, you got to get back here. Because Lewis, I made like a half a million dollars today. If you were here, you would have made $5 million. I go, yeah. So, you know, how are you going to get back? So I, I called, I actually called British Airways and saw if they had a Concorde flight. So I flew from Switzerland to, to British Airways. I paid $15,000 one way to fly to Concorde uh, to get back to uh, uh, the States. And I had a euro dollar position. I had a thousand euro dollars on it that had gone into the cabinet. So for your 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 viewers, uh, meaning went they were worthless, right? And they were ninety four euro. I'll never forget that they were ninety four euro, euro dollar calls. So the strike price would be ninety four before they'd be in the money. Well, when I left, the euros were like ninety two and a half. So they were, you know, they were going to expire worthless. So um, I get on the I get on the uh, Concorde. I get on the plane in New York and I'm having trying to use the phone and my credit card wouldn't work. It, the, it, the magnet on it, remember you had to use the yeah, credit yeah, card? Yeah, 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 yeah. I looked at the stewardess. I go, here's $200. Let me use your credit card. She goes, what? I go, please let me use your credit card. <laughs> oh my God. And she gives me her credit card. She goes, I don't want the money. I go, trust me, honey, keep the 200. It's going to be worth it. And so I call the floor. My Euro dollars opened up at 94 and a half. But now they were already down to like 93, 70. So I had like, I if I would have, if I was able to sell the euros at 94 half, two days later, they were back to 92 and a half, right? I would have made 2 million bucks on that trade. But I, I made about 450,000 in the open, uh, um, what do you call it? The open, um, and then trading the options. So the options yeah, I got yeah, out, yeah, yeah. made about 450 on those. Now I'm flying back. I get back to the I get back to the floor on Tuesday morning. I get there in the pit about eleven o'clock. It was a ghost, it was literally a ghost town. I mean, wow. there were guys were clearing from people took the people out of the out of the pit because they didn't have enough money in their yeah, accounts. Yeah, yeah. People that were filling orders put their decks down because they didn't want the exposures of an out trade. Yeah. And so I traded a little bit there Tuesday, um, you know, made a you know hundred thousand. Then Wednesday made like two fifty, and then the famous trade came Thursday morning. Um, and that so was the happened, George Soros trade, right? Yeah. So Shearson used to fill all George Soros' orders, okay. And so they put an order in to sell twenty five hundred S and P's, and they put it in twice. So two Shearson brokers on opposite side of the pit we're asking for a, a pre-market opening and they're looking at me and they go, we're a thousand lower. I go, I'm 2000 lower. We're 3000 lower. I go, I'm 4,000 lower. This is before we had circuit breakers. Wow. Right? And boom, the market opens up and I want to go buy him. And the guy behind me tackles me and says, here's 400. And he sells me 400 at the low. And I look up and all I see is panic on everybody. Everybody's panicking. Now I got 400 S and P's on, right? And you know, in a 400 lot is you know what are you talking about? Maybe uh, what is that? 25 up, about 2,000 a tick, right? Yeah. And we're not moving in one tick. I we're moving in hundreds and five hundreds and thousands. So I get these 400. I'm long 400. I look across the pit. I see a guy. He looks at me, and it, it, it was. It was good that I was the biggest trader because everybody was always looking at me. Right? Yeah, and right. He goes, he goes, what are you doing? I go, I'm a seller. He goes, I'm a buyer. He goes, how many you got? I go, 400. Boom, I sell them. And then I take my card, hand it out to my clerk. And I said, go count this up. And she comes back and she goes, you made $1.3 million. I go, what? I, I literally, first time I ever got fear on my face. And I just, I walked into the washroom and I threw up. And I was like, I it's, an it's an amazing you know? story. It's an amazing story. So it's one of the most famous trades. When you, there's a lot of books out there, they talk about my 1.3 million in 13 seconds or whatever it is. But 
You know what? Over my career, um, there were a lot of big days, but most of my career was hitting a lot of singles, right? Being right every day. You had to, you know, you got to have the mentality that you make money every day and you don't have to swing for the fences every day, right? Right. Babe Ruth hit the most home runs, but he had the most strikeouts too. Right, right, right. 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 (laughs) So, well, this was great. Lewis, this was great. And I I really want to express my appreciation to you of coming on. I've enjoyed it so much. I know my listeners uh, uh, and the people who watch the channel, they're going to enjoy it. I'll post it up here, but you're a great guy, man. And, uh, you know, it's an honor to have met you. I know we're never close or friends, but it's cool to get to talk to you. And uh, I really, really appreciated this. Thank you so much. So I'll give you a little, just one in closing. Um, there's a guy out here trying, writing a screenplay, uh, and Stars just bought it. So uh, we're doing ten episodes. Oh right, right. There. You mentioned that you're going to be in it, right? Yeah, I'm going to be the. I'm going to be help produce it and write it. So send me the link, and I'm going to put it up on the uh, on the. Yeah, video as soon as we get it, as soon as we get it finalized, I'll I'll send it to you. Awesome, man. All hey, right, buddy. Mike. Nice meeting. Thank you. you so much, man. It was you got a pleasure. It. Take care. Right.